you have cancer. These are three words you never, ever want to hear. The very word cancer brings to mind suffering and early death. Many of us here tonight have cancer, or are cancer survivors, or have a loved one who have battled cancer. Cancer is a tragedy, made even worse by its apparent randomness. Cancer cuts down the healthiest people among us, people in the prime of their lives, the skinny people, the exercising people, the eating right people. No one would dispute that cancer needs to be eradicated. And in acknowledgement of this, the world has come together and moved mountains in science and industry to take on cancer. We can now diagnose cancers at their earliest stages. We have new tissue sparing techniques for surgery. We have incredible new drugs that target just cancer cells and leave normal cells untouched. Cancer remains, but cancer survivors are living longer and have better quality of life than ever before. Now contrast these three words, you have cancer with you are fat. Different thoughts come to mind, right? Society tells us that if you are fat, you are a failure. You just lack willpower. You're weak. Us doctors are trained to recognize obesity in patients, but we have little more to offer our patients than advice on eating healthy and exercising more. Seriously, is that all we've got? Healthy diet and exercise are great advice for anyone. But surely, if that's all we give our obese patients, we are setting them up for frustration, failure, and shaming. Society's constantly negative attitude towards obesity is curious to me, especially given the fact that nearly 70% of us in the United States are either overweight or obese. Maybe we've just become desensitized to our own obesity. Even so, it doesn't change the fact that one out of 10 deaths per year in the United States is the direct result of obesity. In comparison, just over two deaths out of 10 per year in the United States are due to cancer. So if cancer doesn't kill you, being obese just might. And let me tell you, dying from obesity isn't so different from dying from cancer. It's a long, excruciating process for most patients. You'll be bedridden, you'll develop diabetes, circulatory and breathing problems, infections eventually, and then multi-organ failure. So why can't we all just lose weight and keep it off? And is obesity really a choice? Or is it part of a larger biological plan? To me, implicit in the notion of choice is the idea that making healthy decisions will result in success, whereas making poor decisions will lead to failure. Unfortunately, obesity just doesn't pay attention to this logic. Data show that severely obese individuals who worked on diet and exercise and actually succeeded in losing 10% or more of their body weight nearly all rebounded within three years, usually gaining back even more weight after five years. In reality, there's a better chance of surviving the very deadliest form of thyroid cancer than of simply maintaining weight loss over a five-year period. Look, I'm not trying to equate the imminent threat of death from cancer with weight regain after losing weight. But I do think that juxtaposing obesity outcomes with cancer survival rates illustrates the incredible strength of the biology that drives each of these diseases. So what is this fat stuff? We often think of fat like whale blubber, sort of an amorphous, gelatinous substance that accumulates on our bodies. But in fact, Fat is a very complex organ. The scientific name for fat is adipose tissue, or just adipose for short. Early anatomists thought of adipose as sort of a passive storage depot for energy taken in from the diet and stored as fat. But we now know that adipose is actually a very complex organ containing several different cell types, including blood vessels and immune cells. And the central player in adipose is the adipocyte itself, a rounded cell with a central fat storage droplet. Adipocytes 
actively secrete a range of substances that can travel through the bloodstream to influence other organs, controlling many aspects of bodily functions. Remarkably, growing adipose tissue that occurs in obesity actually exhibits all the hallmarks of cancer itself. It grows all by itself without any growth signals. It can grow virtually without limit. It builds its own blood supply to feed itself as it goes. It invades other tissues, wrapping itself around abdominal organs, the pancreas, the heart. It manages to activate the immune system, causing inflammation throughout the body, but somehow it itself escapes immune attack. And finally, it hijacks metabolism to drive its own relentless expression. And what's amazing about adipose is that it doesn't just influence metabolism in the organs and cells that it invades, the way cancer does. Adipose actually manages to hijack the entire body's metabolism. Our bodies have evolved the natural ability to cycle between building fat when nutrients are available and burning fat for energy when nutrients are scarce. With more nutrients around, we naturally eat more and adipose tissue grows. And as, as it grows, adipocytes secrete more and more of the hormone leptin into the bloodstream. Leptin travels through the circulation to a part of the brain called the hypothalamus, which then activates the central nervous system to increase calorie burning and decrease appetite. Together, these responses cause weight loss again, constantly restoring fat in a sort of continuous equilibrium back to its original state. Unfortunately, this elegant mechanism breaks down whenever nutrients are constantly available. And think about it. The existence of supermarkets, refrigerators, and fast food simply weren't part of our evolutionary programming. With constantly available nutrients, adipose is driven to constantly expand, resulting in chronically high levels of leptin. Along with other factors, this produces a state of leptin resistance in the hypothalamus. And while adipose continuously cranks out more and more leptin, the signal is just simply ignored in the hypothalamus. As a result, calorie burning stalls out and appetite is no longer controlled. So how important is leptin really? Very important. On your left behind me is a mouse that lacks the gene for leptin. This mouse grows fat but can't produce leptin. And so it can't activate calorie burning or turn off hunger. It just grows fatter and fatter and fatter. Next to her is an identical mouse that has been treated by injections with purified leptin. Restoring leptin restores the normal equilibrium that controls body fat. There are also cases of humans born without leptin, like the boy pictured behind me on your right. This boy weighed about 100 pounds at age three. He was treated by leptin injections, just like the mouse, and restoring leptin returned him to normal body fat and growth. And on your far right, there's a picture of him four years later at age seven. Here he weighs still 30 pounds less than he did at age three. So yes, leptin is very important. And leptin also seems to hold at least part of the key that explains why sustaining weight loss and obesity is nearly impossible once obesity has become established. The problem comes when that same obese individual who has leptin resistance now loses weight through hard diet and exercise and their fat mass shrinks so that they are making less and less leptin. Losing weight reduces their adipose tissue, their leptin drops, and this produces a persistent energy gap between their increased hunger and their decreased ability to burn calories. In no uncertain terms, the double defect of leptin resistance and decrease in leptin production dooms most obese individuals to be stuck with obesity for their entire lifetime. And so I propose to you that obesity is first and foremost a biological problem and secondarily a choice. And as I've shown you, there is very powerful biology in place that resists our best efforts at weight loss. But is all given up? Should we just stop trying? Heck no, modern science and medicine know how to take on the biology of disease. Look what we've done with cancer over the past century. And so a medical cure for obesity shouldn't be out of our grasp. I mean, really, it should be around the corner, right? In 2018, the projected budget for the National Institutes of Health, 
the premier funding source for medical research, will commit about $8 billion to funding for cancer research. That's just in one year, $8 billion. But obesity is allotted less than 10% of that. And folks, you get what you pay for. Over the past 10 years, there have been over 200 new drugs and combination therapies approved for cancer. There have been only six new drugs approved for obesity. Again, you get what you pay for. So I want to leave you with two parting messages. First, act locally. Suppress your judgments about obesity. Think about obesity as something other than the fault of your obese family, friends, or coworkers. Think about it as something other than weakness or laziness. These people have a serious medical condition with biological underpinnings that rival those of cancer. Second, act globally. Ask your legislators to sponsor bills to prevent childhood obesity. If we can prevent obesity, this problem won't exist. Insist that insurers and health systems also take proactive measures to prevent obesity, and that they provide treatment for obesity that actually has impact on patients' lives. And demand access to medical and surgical treatments for obesity, including more spending on obesity research and pharmaceutical development. Just like fat is ever-growing, the problem of obesity is ever-growing worldwide. And it's on us to take this threat seriously and to declare war on obesity. And in doing so, we need to take a page out of the war on cancer. This was a very successful playbook that has brought new hope and healing to so many lives. Thank you for listening and thinking about these issues.